Well, hello everybody. Today we're going to answer the question, who was Eber, generation 14? Let's use the periodic table of history and geography to increase our understanding. We can see our 6,000 years of history over here on the left side. Also, we see our axis around the equator. So I'm over here in the United States. I don't know where you're from, but you might be over in Japan. You might be over in India. You might be over in Greece. And you might be over in Iceland. Wherever you are, what we're going to do is teleport from where we are over into the Middle East. And then we're going to go back in time and figure out who is Eber. You can see on the y-axis we have 3000 BC here, also 2000 BC. We're going to use our time machine and go right back into this zone. There is Eber, and these are as-is dates from Genesis, not calibrated dates. We'll change his life bar to yellow so we can see him just a little bit easier. There is Eber. Incredible. His lifespan goes all the way down to Jacob. On the grand scheme of things, his life almost hits Reuben, the firstborn son of Jacob. We can zoom in here to our approximate location of Eber. Genesis 10:24 states, And Arphax had begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. So the spelling Eber is listed in Genesis 10, 11, and 1 Chronicles. But we also have classic Dr. Luke in the Gospel of Luke, rendering the name Heber. The Luke chapter 3 genealogy is the one to the most important figure in the history of the world. And I'll let you figure out who that is. Now Luke and Josephus have the same spelling. In Josephus we read, Selah was the son of Arphaxad, and his son was Heber from whom they originally called the Jews Hebrews. That's from the Antiquities of the Jews 6.3. Since Eber is rendered Heber by Josephus, I've got a Hebrew joke for you. A group of five Hebrew women were eating lunch in a busy cafe. Now, nervously, their waiter approaches the table. Ladies, he says, is anything okay? I know, you get it. I hear you laughing from here. Well, as you already knew, this is where we get the word Hebrew from. I come across people who are confused with words like Semites, Hebrews, Israelites. The word here, Hebrew, is the distinction between Hebrew and Israel. So in this word, we have the distinction between Hebrew and Israel. Hebrew covers the people descended from Peleg and Joktan. And remember, Abraham came from Peleg, so people from Abraham are Hebrews. And they are also Semites because they came from Shem. Now, the Indians, Myanmarese, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Koreans are in part descended from Eber, that is Heber, also. So they are also Hebrews. And we know from the Selah video that Eber's father is part Shemitic and part Japhethite. Doesn't that make you super curious? Because it sure does to me. Now be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments section so everyone can learn together. I'm going to put some arrows here just so we know when we zoom out where the lifespan starts and where it ends. So the genetics of these patriarchs are incredible. Eber in generation 14 almost lives to see Jacob's first son in the 23rd generation. And we can check out this graph and I direct your attention to Eber, you can see that there's quite a genetic degradation for Peleg, Ru, Serug, and then everybody else beyond this point. So Eber is the last of the 400-year patriarchs. The 100-year humans had to write stories to deify these people, throwing the trajectory of humanity off to a great degree. There are about 116 people from generation 10 to generation 14. I wonder how this number coincides with the number of gods made up about the time before 2000 BC. Now keep in mind these are only the most significant people documented about these patriarchs. Frequently Genesis adds the phrase to people, and they bore other sons and daughters. 
So by the 14th generation, the actual population would have exploded. Nimrod in generation 13 would have come on the scene by this time. Genesis states, At the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Nobody really knows where Kalna is, and one rendition of the word in Hebrew means all of them. So this passage can mean Babel, Eric, Akkad. All of them are in the land of Shinar. Well, I have three of these cities listed here. You see Babel was right by the Tower of Babel. Eric, I think, is Uruk. And then Akkad is up here in the land of Shinar. So these are definitely cities of Nimrod, and it is very possible that Nimrod is Sargon. We can look out at what Sargon or Nimrod would be looking at in his time. We can see the rivers of the Euphrates, the Tigris, the Sirwan. We can come up here to where Eber is. Now somehow Eber got away from the sting of Nimrod. And as we look at the geography, we can see the escape routes. The line of Arphaxad going down to Eber, that's Arphaxad, Selah, Eber, are close to the mountain lakes and streams. So they are located in a place where they can run to the hills. The hills also happen to be the area inhabited by Peleg's brother, Joktan. That's fast forwarding just a little bit. Peleg's brother, Joktan, goes east, whereas Abraham goes west. Arphaxad is well known to be in this area, and Selah and Eber are family of Arphaxad. Eber also happens to mean the region beyond, so perhaps he was just out of reach from Nimrod. And I can see very clearly how this can happen, because we have Arphaxad over here in the land of Arphaxad. We have Selah over here guarding this river, Arphaxad has an escape route through this river up to the lakes and the mountains. As soon as you get to this area, as long as you know the topography, you can make your way through these mountains and escape from Nimrod's grasp. So we can see that if Eber lived anywhere in this vicinity, he also has the same escape route to get out of Dodge through this area. So as soon as you get into this escape route, you can come over here to the kingdom of the Medes. All of that is extraordinarily interesting, strategically and historically. Now, Arphaxad has a brother named Asher of Assyria, and it turns out the city by Asher's name is right here, located extraordinarily close to where Arphaxad is located. There is a scripture that talks about Asher in Genesis chapter 10. It says, Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kela and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kela, the same is a great city. So this is completely fascinating when we look at the strategy of this. Kela could be Kalak. Now Rezin means fountainhead from the Bavian inscriptions of Sennacherib. Rehoboth is an elusive city. By one rendering, it may be called center city which could be Asher. It's the kingpin city here, strategically located along the Tigris River. Now, if you read this same scripture in the NIV, it's Genesis 10, 11, and 12, it has Nimrod building everything. But when you read it in the King James Version, Asher is building the city of Asher. And it makes a whole lot more sense logistically and strategically. Of Nimrod, Genesis states, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So here is the land of Shinar. Uruk can be a rendition of Erech. Akkad possibly is here. Babel. So this is the stomping ground of Nimrod. And as we look over the strategy, one of the things that Sargon is known for is going back and forth around all these cities in the plain of Shinar, whenever harvest time came, he would get his people to beat up whoever was producing, and then he would steal the fruit of all their labors. So this is a terrible time 
when everybody would have to be trying to produce as much as they can, storing things away, and then defending against Nimrod or Sargon. And you can see how Asher and Arphax had are backed off here, and how Eber is strategically located to go to the west along the Euphrates or over the mountain range to the east. And from the five brothers' point of view, this is fascinating too. You have Elam, one of the brothers of Arphax head over here, that is defending the river systems that are by the Persian Gulf. You have Arphax head defending the river systems that are closest to the Tower of Babel. You have Asher defending the drainage of all the mountains that starts the Tigris River. And then if you go even farther to the west, you have Aram, of Syria guarding the Euphrates River. So even though these guys couldn't cover all the land, when you look at where they set up, you can see strategically that they were trying to distance themselves from the Tower of Babel and Sargon or Nimrod. When you look on the big scheme of things, you can see why everyone set up where they did. It is amazing to me. And this is fascinating to understand this, because it makes world history make so much sense. Remember, this is the antagonist of the land. I mean, you do not want to be around with this guy, with, with Nimrod. And you can see up here that Asher, the basis of the Assyrians, who also joined up with Arphaxad, becomes the defense kingdom against Babylon. And that happened for quite a long time. Babylon and Assyria were contenders for a great season. So we can see that Eber lived in the shadow of Arphaxad here. And we can see that as far as his lifespan as well. Because we have Arphaxad, then Selah, and then Eber. Eber saw the death of Noah... He saw the death of Shimham and Japheth, and Arphaxad, and Selah. So after the death of Selah, Eber would have been the main go-to person that has the bulk of the technology of the world. And we can see that he is almost living to the twelve sons of Jacob, and he can be the go-to person of everyone past him, Sarek, Nahor, Terah, and Abraham. If I were to die and there were just five people on the earth that I could get to ask questions to, Eber would be one of them. What questions would you ask Eber? Feel free to comment. When we zoom out, we can see the timeline of history, and we can see that we have certain civilizations back here, the Celts, the Greeks, the Medo-Akkadian Empire, the Indian startup, Chinese, Chinese Myanmar, Vietnam, Korea, and we also have Egypt and the Cushitic Empire. When you can zoom out geographically also, start to realize that these people are here. They're already on the scene. Egypt gets a little bit of shelter because they have a distance between them, but everybody that's in this region happens to be the genesis of all the cultures on society. So when we are studying this, we are studying world history that extends out to all the great civilizations of the world. And that absolutely confounds me. It fascinates me. And I bet you're fascinated with it as well. So we can see how history is woven together. I'll just leave you with this quote from William Ross Wallace. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. So thanks for watching. It's always free to subscribe, thumbs up, share, and comment. And I will see you in the next video. Have a great week.